So I guess to continue a little bit with both disclaimers and a sense of spirit. So my disclaimer, oh, well, happy birthday. Um, my disclaimer is the fact that actually um, internationalism is not necessarily a political word that I use in terms of defining my politics. But I have an affinity to it in as much as I grew up in the context of South Pacific and Southern African universities, which were very much framed at that time by Marxist thinking, by decolonization and liberation thinking, by anti-apartheid struggles. And so in a way, it's a politics that's very familiar. Also, as a feminist, I think feminists have always had an affinity to thinking beyond the nation state. Um, and, you know, nation states have always been um, envisioned and constructed um, by conquerors, by militarists, and by patriarchs. Um, they have never been um, imagined um, as spaces where people who are, you know, framed women, people who are framed black, who are framed queer, who are framed minority, who are framed working class, um, are welcome or considered to be active and important members of society. And so again, there's always a skepticism when it comes to thinking about or valorizing the nation. And a transnational solidarity has always made sense, particularly um, to feminists, and certainly to me as an African feminist. Um, and I also think that it's important to think about this sort of that legacy of a trajectory of thinking in this historical moment. Um, I'm involved in the business of the business of justice. Um, the professionalization of solidarity. And it is a moment when, you know, everything is framed, um, you know, it, as individuals. And women's rights is being sponsored by Gucci. And, you know, and it's, it's, about, it's about individuals. It's about, you know, valorizing individual leaders um, and not actually thinking about the questions which I think something like International puts on the table, which is about, you know, understanding and challenging structural power. Um, and, you know, that actually is our fight. And so I think, you know, to redirect our focus away from only individuals or only business solutions towards thinking about collectivities who struggle against systems of power. Um, uh, you know, and I think that's incredibly valuable. Um, and again, to not just valorize, you know, the, the couple that succeed and live to tweet about it. So um, I just want to think about two, two ideas, two ideas that kind of were evocative to me. Um, the first is imagination. Actually, nothing has ever changed um, without the thought of the dream of it first. Um, and in any you know, system of injustice or any experience of injustice, it's actually that, it's imagination. It's being in the middle of something and having that embodied feeling that something is wrong and that also there's a possibility that it can change. Um, for many of us growing up, music was actually um, our political inspiration. And Bob Marley sang, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. And I think that's what he meant, that actually it begins with a thought. It begins with, with a feeling, a desire, a dream that something can change. And we have to, again, tap back into the creativity of that expansive imagination in thinking about different ways of ordering our world. Um, I work in the context of the body. Um, and even if you look statistically, we know that one in four women will experience violence at least one point in her life just because she is embodied woman, right? That a young African woman is affected by HIV every minute. Those statistics arise from a situation or an imag a social imagination that doesn't deem a woman's body to be hers, to be a terrain that she, uh, that she has sovereignty over, right? And so again, it has been a tremendous imagination as well as incredible transnational organizing that has actually succeeded in reframing a social debate to name, name those things as problems, to name those things as violations and as collective responsibilities to change. Um, the second is, is really um, solidarity. And solidarity, as we're saying, is kind of at the heart of internationalism. Solidarity, I see as a kind of political kinship. We can look at it in a pragmatic sense, but I see it as a kind of political kinship. It actually, again, emerges from a feeling. And that feeling is, act is a desire um, to, to see other people being well, right? We want other people to be well. That's why we fight with them and we fight alongside them for things to change. Um, again, in the spirit of music, an uh, Ethiopian hip-hop MC called um, Gabriel Tiedros just put out a song called Black Love, and it has a line that says, something about your happiness feels like freedom. So again, there's something in, it, in solidarity that is, that is emotive. Right? It's, it's a political kinship based on a desire for other people to be free. I think that solidarity is also a minefield. And I had the pleasure of hearing Angela Davis speak last week, and a couple of things resonated with me. One was, was you know, that we have to actually engage in solidarity, acknowledging our radical differences. And you know, intersectionality is not just a fancy concept, it's a lived experience. And how can we actually engage that and incorporate that into our political visions and strategies, rather than 
uh, fragmenting our movements and our work by saying, you know, environmentalism is over here, militarism is over here, issues of sexuality over there, right? And we fight about them in different terrains. Everything is connected. And again, our politics needs to be also. Um, I also just think that solidarity requires humility. And I'm just going to end on that point, because I think a lot of what we struggle with as, as African women, um, as women generally, is that problem of an overdetermined space, right? So take a debate like FGM. Um, in this country, people only ever talk about FGM as a harmful traditional practice, right? They don't talk about the communities that are affected by FGM and the other issues that affect them. Why can we not have a discussion about FGM in this country alongside a discussion about ethical immigration policies around you know, a, a defunding of public services, right? which affect those very same young women that we're so cared about who we say are victims of tradition, apparently? So again, how do we engage in a solidarity that doesn't erase the voices? When, when you say that somebody is voiceless and I'm speaking on behalf of them, you're in essence taking away their voice. So again, how do we engage in a solidarity that is standing alongside and sometimes actually being led by the very people who struggle you know, you're waging? So I want to end with that and to say again, political imagination and a heart um, together um, are ultimately what makes the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you.